Welcome to the Early Childhood Development in a Time of Pandemic webinar series. And today's topic is play, which is going to be fun. As Zindu was saying, we are so happy today to welcome Brian Harrison from the Red River College in Winnipeg. Uh, just to put a little bit of uh, context over it, you know, uh, this webinar series is part of a big project called the Early Child Development Science to Practice uh, Project, and Red River College is a partner uh, with us. Uh, along with Families Canada so, and the Encyclopedia. Um, within the Red River College, there is the Science of Early Child Development platform, which basically provide uh, workshops, online workshops and e-learning. And it's it's been there for, I guess, the last 20 years. And it's, it is also that Red River College. And um, Science of ECD is currently developing some e-modules for us to share within our project. So we're very happy to welcome Brian. You know, he's been, well, with apart, aside from all these diplomas in, you know, bachelor degree in education, the master degree, he has been an educator uh, working with human beings uh, through the whole continuums from toddlers to um, adults for the last 30 years. Brian is currently a member of the research faculty in the Health Science and Community Services Department of Red River College. We are very happy you're here with us, Brian. But thank you, Isabel. Thank you to all the Families Canada people. It's a real delight to be able to talk, to um, share my thoughts on these topics. So yes, the background of my work is that uh, I largely sit in my office, this dark little office that some of you, you, you can get little hints of, and I work on the computer. So I will work on our science of early child development resource and associated courses. I work on online workshops for Families Canada, many other things. Uh, but I really do have a very strong passion for early childhood education. So anytime I get the opportunity to talk about things like positive guidance or play or any of these related issues, I'm more than happy to come out and uh, share that with you. All right, seems to be working. So as you know, this is this is part of a, a series on children during the pandemic. And I was asked to come in to speak of play. And probably, aside from my academic background, is probably best if I just give you a, a background on what play has been to me and my experience with play. So I'm just going to go to my next slide for that, if you don't mind. So this picture was taken just, this was, picture was taken on Mother's Day, actually, because it was quite nice. My uh, siblings and I met my mother for a walk in a quarry that's in near her house. It's near where I used to live. And this type of environment used to be my backyard. So I grew up in, uh, out uh, just north of Winnipeg, Grey Cup Champions. I don't know if there's any Saskatchewan people out there or not, but I just want to emphasize that Winnipeg is the Grey Cup champions this year. Um, so I, I grew up north of Winnipeg, and our backyard was an abandoned quarry. And you can imagine what a, a wonderful place that would be for a little kid growing up. Now, I've, I've got two brothers and two sisters, but my, my closest in my age, my brother and my sister, <laughs> We would play together all the time, everywhere. And one of the main things we would do is go up into the quarry. So you go up in the quarry, you could make little houses for the tadpoles. You could make all kinds of forts and farms, whatever you want to do. Beyond, beyond every bush, like in the background you see there, you could go through there and there'd be a new place to explore. You could, if you wanted to, have a rock fight. And for the record, if you ever get into a rock fight with your brother, it's the older brother who is responsible if anybody gets hit in the head, which was me. So, of course, there's dangers of children going out and jumping off cliffs and throwing rocks at each other. But I think most of us recognize that within reason, children are, are pretty safe if they go out and explore because we know what our limits are. So... This is not my backyard quarry. My backyard quarry was one quarry over, but this is the type of environment that I grew up in. I was also blessed in that my parents were cleaners and they would clean amongst other businesses, um, computer, 
companies. So a place like Biz uh, Burroughs Business Machines, there's a place called Symbionics. So me as a little kid, and this would be the very early 70s, I would be able to go into these buildings and see real life computers operating or just sitting there. Now we knew that we weren't supposed to touch them and I don't think any of us even thought about going and touching any of these things. But if something, anything that was in the garbage was fair game. So there was always interesting things to explore, little doohickeys and whatnot that we didn't know what they were, but it didn't matter. So a couple big takeaways that we got from those experiences is the freedom and openness of play. It's something that I've really come to appreciate and something that I really promote is a lot of freedom in children's play and a lot of open choice. And that's the type of thing you're going to hear probably in my story coming up. So the main message, the key takeaway here is very simple. It's just sim simply promote play and be there. That's the message that I'm going to hopefully leave with everybody. Now, these are obviously very deep thoughts and, and complex issues if you get right into them. But that's the one thing I think I'd like people to take away. What we need to be doing now during this pandemic, as all times for young children, is to promote play. And that can be support play, encourage play, um, prepare for play, but to take play seriously and give children opportunities to do it. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And the second part, this hugely important part, this component of play is for us to be there. And I don't mean for us to be there running their play. And I don't mean being there with them all the time. My mom certainly wasn't with me in the quarry most of the time. Um, we'd be in the quarry all day and then we'd hear a big dinner bell that my mom would ring when it'd be time for us to come in and wash our hands and eat. But what I'm suggesting is that we make ourselves available and we are with the children, at least in good chunks of time, to make good, meaningful human contact, to support relationships. So these are my overall key points whether it's pandemic time or happy days that will come again, we want to promote, encourage play, but we also want to be there with children. We want to make those, those contacts. We want to be there emotionally and cognitively for the children. I do like to share these filters and by what I mean is um, things that I'll use to guide the topics that I'm discussing or the, the suggestions that I, I want to make. So I will be really focusing on the nature of children. Um, one of my more recent couple, my more recent teaching, there's touching the face again, most recent teaching experiences, which was so nice, was going into some different First Nations communities and myself and a couple colleagues, we would work with uh, teachers who are kindergarten, nursery school teachers, and their EAs, and uh, we presented a course on learning through play. And one of the main things that I always like to suggest was that you want to work with children, work with their nature and not against it. So for example, children need to move, children need to be loud, children need to be active. So if you're planning of your day focuses on mostly having children be quiet and sitting and listening, then you're fighting against the nature of children. But if you work with the nature of children, if you accept that they need to move and act and be active and that they need to play, then you can plan your days that's going to go much more smoothly for yourself, more smoothly for the children, and it's going to be more effective, I believe, in terms of education. So when we're thinking about how we can provide play and how we're gonna be there for children, how we can support them, let's, let's recognize children who, who, for who they are and work with that. Another aspect, a uh, filter, if you will, that I, I like to um, focus through is the idea of respecting our own needs. 
Um, the poll early on came out, seems like there's a lot of people who are listening right now who are group caregivers. And that would be my background, the ECE background. So for ECEs and other people who work with young children, I may, may be more critical and say, well, your job is to do this, your job is to do that. For parents, I'm always ready to cut some slack. It's not easy being a parent and being with children and to be with children 24 seven nowadays, it, it, it must be very, very challenging. I have two grown kids, so they're not a challenge. So if you need to take time to yourself, feel free to take time to yourself. If you need to catch up with your story, watch your Coronation Street, whatever the case may be, give yourself that respect. Give yourself that opportunity. Nothing I want to come out of this webinar would be in any way shaming parents or even sharing, shaming ECEs and other early childhood care, sorry, early childhood caregivers. We don't want to look so much in terms of what's good and bad. Are we doing our job right or doing our job wrong? What I want to do in this discussion today is help develop a sense of what is a good path, a good approach to supporting children through play. And as long as we're moving along that path, we're doing just fine. So respect yourself and accept reality. None of us are perfect. Perfection cannot be achieved. Let's just move along that path. And the final filter that I think really shapes my thinking is if nothing else, and this is not just play, but anything you do with children, make that human contact, that relationship thing, the most important type of thing. Make that as, okay, if I, I, maybe I can't get them to remember all their colors, or maybe I can't, you know, we, how am I, as, especially as home, home teachers, homeschooling now that so many people have had heaped upon them, I say, please don't panic about your children not being, um, getting out of geography lessons you may do with them that they would get in school, for example. The main thing is be there for them, communicate with them, and make human contact with them. So those are the, the bigger, broader filters that kind of shape my thinking. So the first big question that we're asked to address was why it matters. And I don't think that's hard for most of us. Now this, image here probably looks a little a, a little bit sad but i think there's a lot of children that are feeling this way right now a lot of people of all ages that are feeling this way right now that we're, we're caged in you know the world is out there for us to play i don't understand why i can't do it there's this great feeling of of being caged in restricted and stress we know there's so much stress going on right now now, the good news about play is that play is one of the best ways that children can help deal with things like stress because play is a way that children deal with everything. It's the way they parse their world. It's the way they understand their world. It's the way that they practice their world. So if, if children are playing, then you've probably put them in a better place where they can handle these stresses and all this confusion because they need that play to do it. But I want to get past just the idea that we're going to use play to help children deal with stress, as important as that is. I would like us to keep moving to pro promote playful opportunities, playful experiences where children can get past the stress and be doing the kind of play that they need to support their development in general. So that's one direction we're going to get. Um, my wife, it reminds me of a story, my wife who's also an ECE was telling me, I think it was last year, she had these um, couple little guys in her group and I think they were like three, four years old. And one of them had gone through a funeral. So what they did a lot of the time was they would play funeral. So the one guy would say, okay, you be the guy who lies there with your arms like this. And then I'll be the guy who puts the flowers on top of you. 
and th and so following i think th the general guidelines of the key message that i've referred to my wife gave them plenty of opportunity to do that kind of play i don't think she saw any need to make cardboard coffins or hearses or anything like that but she gave them the time and the place and she was there she would observe she would chat with them and if anybody had any questions that they wanted to ask uh, any feelings that they would like to work through she would be there to talk about them with her so that's the example of, of dealing with stressful situations which is so important but also we want to set up play that can get past that stress and just get the best play that we can. Okay, a flip of my timer and a click of my PowerPoint. So what it is and what we're talking about here is what is play. Now, I wasn't going to spend a lot of time in terms of a definition of what is play. Um, by the numbers, uh, so many people who work with caring for other children, your background is probably really good, uh, very strong in terms of what play is. I'm trying to refine it into not a scientific term, but just an understanding that we can all have. I'm using the term true play or meaningful play or optimal play. And I see it not as it's not one or the other, but it's a little bit of um, a bit of a, what's the word I'm looking for here? I use it all the time, two extremes. Al along the line, it'll come to me, a continuum. There we go, thanks, I know everybody's muted. There's probably 30 people saying continuum. So to the left on this continuum is largely adult controlled play. So it would be adults running games. So what time is it Mr. Wolf with the adult playing board games or adults uh, suggesting what the play should be, um, adults saying when the play should be, you know, it's 10.30, it's time to play. Now it's 10.45, let's move over to something else. That's really controlled stuff. And there's a place for adults to control and contribute with play. I'm not suggesting there isn't. But for the ideal play that we're after, this true play that I think is best for children, we want to be more on the other end of that continuum where it's entirely adult, or sorry, child controlled, child initiated, child thought up, and not time bound. So there's not a 20 minute period where they can play, but ideally lots of time, and they set the start and end of the play. Just explore that idea a little bit longer. This is literally a question, but I, I do think about it sometimes, and I, I'll leave it out to you now. We may be able to discuss some of this later. If you're talking about that true play that I'm referring to, that pure play, I think it's only something that children can do. They have a special ability. They can go into another world. And it's so interesting to see them flip in and out of what I can only assume are, are um, if you get into the crazy physics stuff, multiple universes almost. We can we can, as adults, we can kind of mock how, or not mock, but uh, imitate, sorry, how children play. But I don't think adults can get into that true sense of play, especially the pretend type of play, the way that children can. So this is, this is again, a, a deeper look at the type of play I think we should strive for. That's my opinion, and we can discuss that a little bit later. But true meaningful, child-initiated, child control play. It is what it is. It starts when it starts, and it stops when it's time to stop it. Now, what can be done? I've just put a, a number of ideas on here. First of all, in terms of supporting play, I think especially in the time of COVID-19, and perhaps in the time of overprotectiveness of children that we sometimes see, we need this outdoor and active play. If, especially if children are caged in, especially if children are being stressed, but this is important all the time. I've got a link uh, from the encyclopedia that I'll pass along in the chat. I've got a few links that I'll 
pass along at the end in the chat room if anybody wants to grab it. There's some good stuff from the encyclopedia, um, early childhood encyclopedia that really supports this type of stuff. So if you can get outside, please get outside. Um, if you can go for a walk, please go for a walk. For lack of time, I'll just uh, um, just make sure I'll cover most of these. And, and in my mind, these ideas are just things that are going to help you generate ideas in your own mind. And uh, hopefully you just share a few ideas in chat as well that other people can check out too. So one key thing I, I find that really supports play are these two next ones, the idea of variety and novelty. So variety is choice. So they can do different things and novelty. If something's new, it's going to be interesting. So when we were up in the quarry, there was always something new to find, new fossils, new interesting rocks. Um, when we we're cleaning out these different businesses we were at, there was always something interesting in the garbages or by the back door that was going to be thrown out. New things are always going to get children's attention. So if you're finding that children are bored, and by the way, I, I always like to say that boredom is, is uh, it's an opportunity. It's nobody's going to die from boredom, but there is some benefit for us to help children get away from boredom because then it just makes life a little, a little more easy because children who are playing and are happy are a lot easier to be around. So one thing you may want to just switch things up. Um, go find some junk that you haven't had out for a while. Go into the basement, go into the attic, go into the garage. And remember what's junk for us are spaceships and, and um, tanks for little children. They have ama amazing creativity, amazing ma imagination. So if you give children new things, they're going to be much more interested than the same old stuff again and again. And there's no need to spend lots of money. There's no need to spend any money. Um, loose parts, in other words, open-ended material, just junk, just stuff is interesting to children. So give them opportunities to see these and, and to use these things. I did have a thought about how what I might do if I was at home with some young children. I think, well, let's let's accept reality you know, that we want, we need to get stuff done and we want the children to be playing. So maybe you take a, choose a room in your house or a closet in your house, empty it completely, wash the walls, give it that kind of cleaning that you want, dump all the stuff in the living room. It's going to be a mess for a couple of days, but maybe you can use the, um, all that stuff you bring out, make some kind of Rube Goldberg type of, uh, game, you know, where one thing falls over, knocks another thing over. Do a Google of Rube Goldberg. I think it could uh, really support a lot of children, especially school age children. But what I was thinking, okay, I'll do that. I'll clean out a room and then give that room to the children to play in for a day or two. And just having that new space can do some really amazing things for them. Similarly, forts. And when I say fort, it doesn't need to be a be technically afford it could be a children may turn into their dance studio whatever private little space of their own that they want if you give them that it gives that novelty something new to do and it gives them their own space to to be and that's great if it gives you a little bit of breathing space too and i know that sounds a little bit uh, counter to my advice of being there but especially if you're a parent you can't be there all the time if you're an ECE, you're working with other groups of children, that's your job as much as possible to be with children at individually small groups. But there's nothing wrong with parents giving themselves a little bit of a break and some kind of fort or playroom somewhere else is a, is a great way to do it. And I come back to my idea of freedom that I got from the quarry play, for example. What kind of freedom can you allow for children? And I think back to that caged child image, and it takes me again to the outdoor play. Is there a place where you can go and nobody has to hold hands and nobody has to wait and nobody has to just 
be part of a machine, but they're free. They're free to run and they're free to explore with, of course, the safety that you can see them and that they can come back when you need them to. Definitely something I would like really promote. Any type of play opportunities that provide freedom is going to be valuable for you. Of course, there's a lot more, and I'm hoping that people are um, tossing some ideas out in the chat room or the chat section, because I'm sure a lot of people have lots to offer. But I'm going to go to my final big point here, because my, my sand is starting to run a little low. And this is the idea of being there. It's the humanity part. Especially parents, take care of yourself. Block off times for yourself, but maybe you can block off times when you are with your children and that's the priority. So it might be that morning walk that you take every day, or maybe it's the after lunch time when you get together and you all play or you just join in the play or sit with the play with the children. If you are a caregiver in particular, your main job is not to photocopy, it's not to cut things out, it's to be with the children, observing them, chatting with them, getting to know them, learning from the play that you're seeing. And the number one thing that I always suggest that any adult can give to any child, and this is part of the being there thing, is to have meaningful conversations. You don't have meaningful conversations if you're not near the children because it doesn't, it doesn't invite them into conversations. But if you can spend at least part of your time with the children where they're the priority and you're watching them and you're being there with them, that means sitting on the floor with them, sitting beside them, maybe playing along with some of the games, you'd be surprised those are the opportunities where conversations can just naturally occur. And then you're really, really supporting the children's cognitively, socially, emotionally. And finish off the day, if you're a parent, read to the children, have a nice ending to the day, and then think, well, what, what shall we do tomorrow? You may have to limit the time you get to actually play with the children because you're busy, you've got lots to do. But finish the day in that positive way and some optimism for the next day. Reading is a great use of your time. It's a great way to connect that humanity. And as I will always say to anybody related to early childhood education, anytime, please sing. Singing is free, it's joyful, and it has so many benefits for cognitive, especially language development for children. So I'm going to leave it there. I don't know if I go to this one next. Um, Isabella, I'll let you, I'm, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll let you guide us through the next section. Thank you. And, you know, I really like that last image you left us with, Brian. Brian saying, you know, finish the day in a positive way, even though maybe the day wasn't the day we have expected and maybe we we you know we were not happy with because we could not make time with children enough but you know finish with something and you know we forget how a song and all that comes with you know the learning that comes with song reading a book with that proximity with just being there a few minutes it, it comes us down so I think it was a great image thank you Brian Hi, everybody, and uh, my thanks as well to, to you, Brian, uh, to Red River College for um, the presentation today. It was super interesting, and I can see by the chat box that it really touched the, uh, the right uh, note for everybody that's listening. You know, I was thinking about the, um, the evidence that, that outdoor play, no surprise, has really been um, decreasing or at least severely limited during the COVID period because so many of the there's not only social distancing, but so many of the uh, venues like parks have been closed to kids. Um, so, you know, it would be interesting to brainstorm a little bit about what families can do. Um, I'm thinking particularly of those who don't have a backyard, who may only have a, uh, a balcony in an apartment, for example, or those that don't have a green space or a park close by. Um, and you still want to get those kids outside where they can be loud and they can, 
um, you know, run around a little bit, burn off some steam, but do all of the things that children ought to do when they're playing outside. Yes, I think that's that's such a key issue. And and then you think, well, maybe they don't have a balcony. They've just got an apartment. So outside is the sidewalk or the back alley. But you know what? There's there's a hundred times more stuff outside on the sidewalk in the back alley than there is in the house because there's always a new mm -hmm. butterfly there's always a new ant there's always a new bird there's always new things and that idea of novelty is one thing that i was really mm -hmm. uh impressing upon as well so if you want novelty one of the safest things is to to do is to go outside just another suggestion i would make and this comes the uh, to the filter of reality especially for parents, we are busy and there's stuff we want to do. I'd love to take you down the road to the park, but I've got all this stuff I have to do. Is it possible that there's some stuff, like if you're sorting out material or, or working on stuff, just throw it in a bag or a, a basket or a wagon, drag it off to the, the park with you, and you can sit on a bench and be doing your work while the children have that freedom and they go out to play putting the being there uh, um, filter on, you're sitting on that bench. Some children want to run off and go and play, but that bench next to you is a nice place to sit. Maybe they can help you out, or maybe it just turns into a, a lovely little chat session. And so, you know, accepting the fact that we are human and we have lots that we have to do, especially parents, if you're being paid to be with children, your number one job should be that human connection with them. But recognizing those limitations, is there a way that we can meet our needs, but also be meeting the, the children's needs at the same time? That's just a thought. Well, I just uh, noticed as a follow-up to that, that uh, Marcia put a note in the, uh, in the chat box that um, she did a session uh, online, in this case, with kids where uh, it was a sunny, beautiful day, and they ended up on balconies and made paper airplanes and box kites and sort of animated the whole uh, session that way. Now, there's, there's a fun idea. Right. And the balcony, or again, or the sidewalk, it's got it's got the wind, it's got the change in the wind, it's got the change in the temperature, it's got the rain that falls down, it just gives so much to us that our inside limited spaces, it, it just doesn't have. I'm just seeing the mm -hmm. comment about the, the wonder wagon that people have taking out for the walk and then collect stuff, bring it home, that's, that's a great idea. That's, and that's you know a what? really good idea. For a couple of days and get rid of it when you don't want it anymore. Yeah, really, really good idea. Um, um, one, one person uh, raised a question about children with special needs. Uh, is there any suggestion, maybe if uh, parents are afraid to take their children outside in these conditions that we are living in uh, presently? Um, is there any maybe uh, uh, special ideas or... Uh, and don't hesitate to also, uh, participants, uh, share your ideas in the chat box. But, uh, Brian, maybe you have uh, something uh, to share yes, with I, us. I was, I was just going to say it's certainly not an area of expertise uh, for me. And I, I imagine there's a lot of people with a lot of expertise that can share their ideas on the side. But I'm thinking everybody, absolutely everybody needs the joy of nature and the challenge of nature and the variety and novelty of nature. So it would, a uh, special need would be, well, what are the needs? Of course, you're going to have to put more work into, if it's a mobility issue, it's even harder for um, parents or, or just caregivers, but it's worth that extra time. No, I just want to, to thanks Brian. That was a good guide he gave us the children play outside. I agree with that. I just want to say thank you to Brian. Oh, thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Hi. Um, I put it in the chat, but it is something that I'm really being um, thoughtful about right now. So as an early childhood educator, um, immersed in the school system, I've been advocating for play for many years. And, and people are really um, supporting that. 
but I feel with um, our schools opening up on June 1st, and we actually have students in our schools right now, um, the whole question around social distancing and, um, you know, keeping people safe has become an issue, and I'm concerned about how that's going to affect play. And if people have some suggestions on how to, um, to support the play, I, you know, it's so important. We know all of that, but I think people are really fearful parents, children, staff, um, and I'm just wondering if anybody has any ideas or any um, experiences with that. I was um, working in our emergency out of school care here and um, again wanting to support play. So one of the strategies I used was rather than, for example, have the water table open with children come and play, I set up individual water trays so that children could still play with those experiences and be close to each other. Um, but I'm, I'm, that's what I'm thinking about is how do we support that play in a way, as Brian described, that allows children to be independent and to have long periods of time and still feel safe. Yeah, I, and I thought you had a very good example there. And that's something that I didn't uh, address directly, um, play in with social distancing. And that's a challenging one. And I think that these ideas like you have, we, we may have to split some stuff up that we're used to having as a group. But I'm, uh, I don't know how we're going to handle some of these things. We may just have to accept, and I speak for myself here, I don't want to get anyone into trouble. We may have to accept that if you're going to have children together uh, in, in groups, that there's going to be touching and that there's going to be um, exchange of germs. So I'm thinking we we'll probably have to be careful with our sanitation and encourage the hand washing, but not in a, a way that panics children, but try to keep our hands clean and keep ourselves um, a little separated more than we have been in the past. But the number, you know, the, I guess one of the biggest things for me again is that humanity thing. And especially uh, you know, my background is working with a lot of toddlers and preschoolers. The idea of not touching children, not hugging them, not having them sit on your lap when you read to them. You know, this, this is, uh, I think this will be a challenge. And what we need to do then, if we are having less physical contact, then we have to make our humanity shown even stronger in other ways. So that is the idea of just being there with the children, watching them play, maybe play along, talking with them, but being available for them because it shows that you care about them as people. So especially you people who are paid to be working with children, because I, I never, I don't mind uh, lecturing people because that's my background. Um, I'm working with children in a uh, group care. Um, it really now more than ever is not a time to spend your time cutting out little ducks for them to glue stuff on. It's not a time to do the photocopying. It's not time be to sit behind a desk. It's a time to get to know each and every uh, one of these children individually. And it's a time to chat with them, to sing songs with them and to be there with them. So um, I'm guessing I, didn't really answer the question. I kind of took it in my own little direction. But Colleen, I, I think that's the model that you suggest where, okay, let, maybe we can't do the, the big water table. Maybe we can have more options for these individual types of play. But I don't know how we're going to move forward with any kind of idea that children are not going to come together. And I don't see a very happy future where we as adults are not allowed to be in the personal bubble of children. Again, thank you. Uh, there is so much, and I know those ideas. I think and one thought that I have in mind is, you know, what you're saying, Brian, about, you know, we'll be, and Colleen, what you said about, we'll be testing new ideas where exploration can be there differently, but so much ideas will be developed and creativity you know this situation cre probably will be enabling us to try new ideas but there's so much to learn and i know that among the group here there's so great ideas so please share those ideas so mm -hmm. we can build on from that thank you 
And there yeah. are a lot of ideas in the chat box, so I invite you to uh, to save the chat box before you leave the meeting because uh, everyone is just sharing and it's uh, great uh, great ideas for indoors and outdoors. So yes, and Brian, you want to say a final word? Yes, I just wanted to say I I had already done. I just click in the chat box, go Control A to select them all, and then Control yeah. C to copy, and I paste them into. Uh, a word document and I'm really looking forward to uh, reading to mm -hmm. reading. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone. That brings us to the end of today's discussion. Uh, please visit our websites to access more resources on play and other many topics uh, that could be useful for you. So stay safe and uh, see you again next week.